looking into the future. I think even the Chinese realized that uh, Shanghai mm -hmm. had caught the Mumbai flu. And when I went to China I, in, in, in Shanghai, I think it was 2005, it was very interesting to see how methodical the, the Chinese were going about uh, urban renewal in Shanghai. Now, we are not rich, as rich as the Chinese. So let's not wait until our young urban centers overgrow themselves before we plant them and provide tra transport. And finally, something very important is what I call urban agriculture. Now, uh, Singapore is perhaps the leading city in the world about urban agriculture. If you go to Singapore, you'll find people have uh, some hangings on their floors in tall buildings growing <laughs> vegetables, <laughs> one type or the other. Yeah. Now something has now come up, which my wife also came up with during COVID times, which I think is very important to, to urban agriculture in our country. It's called corn farming. Uh, maybe sometime later we can talk about corn farming, but it's very po impo important in a place like Singapore. And finally, and this is what I made last, it's about governance and public policy. Sometimes we talk about governance and public policy before we think about what policy we are talking about. And first, it is important to lay down what are kind of policies that we are going to have in, 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 in building urban centers in the future. And those policies should inform the content of governance and public policy. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Governor. Liz Antonjira, the Global Communication Director, AMREF Health Africa. Cities and urban centers are characterized by, you know, uh, overpopulation and congestion. And, and, and this actually was a problem in the management of uh, the spread of COVID-19, really. And, and most people had to, you know, stay home and do, and do these other things. As a matter of public health, what lessons can we draw from what we have experienced by way of lockdowns and restrictions on movement, uh, do you think? Thank you. Thank you very much, Edmond. Hello, everybody. I'm joining you virtually. I think pandemics have, is not something new. Since mid-1300, we were struck by the largest pandemic we've ever experienced that led to the death of about 70 to 200 million in a span of people in a span of 20 years. And we've seen over time having Zika, um, swine flu, Ebola, and now COVID-19. And, you know, being the largest health development organization working with different governments across Africa, the 35 countries that we operate in, one of the biggest challenges has been implementing some of these guidelines in informal settlements. We're talking about 1.5 meters social distance when ideally a lot of these people in informal settlements live two centimeters away from each other. We have a tendency of, of talking about, you know, making accessible, clean water, wash your hands, sanitize, yet a lot of people don't have the food. So they're left with, you know, choices between buying a sanitizer or buying water or buying food for their families. I think what um, COVID-19 has brought to the fore is really the fragile health systems that we have not only in Kenya, but across Africa. And it has also brought to the fore the need for water as a basic human right. Otherwise, then what we keep talking about will not come to fruition and cannot ideally be um, implemented. I think one of the greatest and learning lessons for us as we worked with various governments in trying to curb and flatten the curve is um, working with community health workers. We have been at the fore trying to ensure that community health workers are recognized and remunerated um, as a really significant and critical role they play in the health ecosystem. So community health workers are the people identified within various communities to you know, assist in health education. And they've been very critical when it comes to just going to households and educating them around ways to protect themselves. But I think the biggest learning lesson is trying to ensure that everybody has access to water as a basic human right. Thank you, Liz. And, and that was actually a, a, a major issue uh, in some of the urban centers and cities that we have in Kenya. And, you know, uh, hygiene being identified as one of the virus defenses and, and most of these informal settlements do not have clean running water. Let me come to you, Mr. Louis Otieno, the non-executive director at Nation Media Group and an IT expert. So um, governments encouraged citizens to, to, to move into technology as, as, as a way of perhaps transactions, as, as, 
as a way of perhaps shopping. You know, you don't have to go physically to a supermarket or, or a, a market for that matter, so you can use some form of technology uh, to do your transactions while staying at home, so that way you avoid interactions. What lessons did we pick out from that, and can we develop that going forward? Yeah, thanks, uh, Edmund. Um, what we're talking about here is one of the factors in terms of transmission of this kind of pandemic, and it's um, a factor known as what, I, what I'm calling mobility. Mm -hmm. The trick here is to minimize mobility, uh, because by minimizing mobility, you're also reducing what they call reproduction, or RT, mm -hmm. which is the ability of um, what happens when one person is affecting other people, right? So that's reproduction. Uh, we're getting good data from the, our emergency operations um, uh, centers on a daily basis, but what we're not getting at a micro level is data that relates to produ uh, reproduction, and definitely we're not paying attention to the mobility number. Mm -hmm. So when you hear the interventions like stay at home, that's to minimize mobility. If you have to move, you'll hear interventions like social distancing and things like those. So technology is an enabler for all this. Mm -hmm. um, I think we take it for granted, but you and I, if you reflect over the last few months, you'll see that you've embraced technology mm -hmm. in, a, in a different way. And essentially what we're gonna end up with is this hybrid kind of socializing. Um, hybrid kind of engagements such as the one we have today. So um, I see um, cities growing because that's kind of how you started the presentation, how this pandemic is going to influence the growth of, of cities. We've already heard from Ms. Uh, Sharif that 50% of our environment will be in the cities, but I think it's going to be slightly different in the sense that we're probably going to be looking at metropolises, meaning that an aggregation of neighborhoods. And when you call it neighborhoods, it's, it's almost a self-contained neighborhood. There is uh, there's hospitals, medical services, there's markets, banking, schools, churches, all that. So there's no reason for you to move from one neighborhood um, to the, that's kind of what I see mm -hmm. anticipate going to happen. Okay. Now, what's going to enable that is technology. Um, again, to minimize things like that. How do we move we already know on the service side, banking, et cetera, you don't have to even leave your house. Mm -hmm. You can do all your banking, et cetera. But how do you receive your goods? Mm -hmm. So I think in Africa, we have an opportunity here to innovate. We have excess capacity by way of young people and a lot of border borders. Mm -hmm. You don't need to go to the market. Border borders can bring the goods to you. Mm -hmm. That means market days are every day, right? So all you order on a technology-based platform, and somebody comes and delivers it to you. That way, you're minimizing mobility. That way you're minimizing repro reproduction, and that way you're controlling um, uh, the pandemic. Ms. Maimuna, based on the um, article that you penned, what are the basics, do you think, fundamentals for an urban center in the face of what we are experiencing and uh, going forward indeed? Uh, thank you very much uh, uh, for that question. I would like to uh, to try to approach your question in two uh, ways. One is what is the COVID-19 actually uh, reflect? One is the inequalities in cities. Second is the there is a development deficit, development gap in the cities. And the third, we need to strengthen the strengthening of the capacities of the local government. And the fourth is we need to look into the resilient, inclusive gender approach, green recovery. And what is the next step. I totally believe to get, uh, uh, and agree with the uh, governor's professor that we need an integrated planning policy at the national level. Mm -hmm. Integrated meaning that, if we, yeah, we have many ministries, agriculture, ministry of transport, which is our housing, but we need an integrated policy. Without an integrated policy, I think we cannot uh, challenge or we cannot recover well. Second is we really need the whole of society planning approach, integrated approach from the vertical to the horizontal, meaning that national, global, national, regional, at the same time also on the local level and uh, at the communities. And the third one is we need to look into the new model of planning and design, meaning that the compact mixed use cities, 
integrated land use and design mm. and also the neighborhood planning like 15 minutes uh, uh, neighborhood or the or the donut neighborhood something like that and and again i think we need to have a very green recovery to make cities cleaner greener safer healthier and the people are happy to stay in the cities yes. and last but not least UN Habitat is here ready to work together with you uh, and ready to collaborate and in in the recovery after this uh, COVID-19 if there is after COVID-19 oh we have to build to to live within the pandemic yes. thank you very much over to you Thank you. Uh, Governor, based on what uh, she says, and, and, and uh, one of the things to come out of this was, uh, you know, the closure of markets. So people need uh, fresh produce, mm -hmm. but the market has been closed for obvious reasons, so I cannot access that. The other thing that emerged was, uh, you know, the need for physical exercise. So you had people waking up very early in the morning, and uh, because they do not have some of these recreational facilities, they were running on roads, and some of them were arrested for that. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> remind me if it was in Kisumu, was it? <laughs> was that your order, by the way, Governor? No, if you go to Kitui, <laughs> if you go to Meshimewa Kitui, <laughs> and you are found running on the road at night, they will call you Mundu Mulosi. Now, as a judge walk, you see. <laughs> but but if you go to City of Kisumu today, you will find that we are reviving our parks and and mm -hmm. putting facilities there. You know, um, uh, facilities for exercises, for games, and so on. In fact, uh, we we are even going to have some outdoor, outdoor. What do you call them? These uh, health clubs. You know, where you can go and do all your things that you can do in a gym, but in the open air. These are some of the lessons we have learned from COVID, and that's one of the reasons why we are reviving our eight parks mm -hmm. in, in Kisumu City and equipping them uh, in a way that they're user friendly. In, uh, I would say, not post-COVID, but notwithstanding COVID, because mm -hmm. we don't know how long COVID is going to be here. So I want to be faithful to my friend Kama and say, notwithstanding COVID, we have to develop this, these parks. Mm -hmm. I remember I mentioned the use of green space as an important aspect of urban planning in the future, and Maimuna has actually confirmed this. We have discussed this extensively, especially when we visited Denmark together, mm -hmm. and we found how they have planned their cities in terms of integrated neighborhoods and use of green space and so on. And one other thing is how do you use, you deal with waste, uh, all kinds of waste mm -hmm. in urban yes. centers. Yes. That's a major challenge. You can see we don't want to reproduce the Dandora phenomenon here, although it was already here in terms of Kachok, but we have decommissioned that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we are opening a center for waste to energy uh, uh, business uh, so that uh, waste becomes not a waste but an opportunity to use it as a raw material for something else yes. in, in urban centers. Now, I think uh, Louis said something very important which we picked up from what I was saying. Look, um, you know, Nyerere was not wrong many years ago when he started uh, Ujamaa villages. Only that Ujamaa villages was started at a time when the productive capacity of, the, of, of society, of the economy, could not support Ujamaa villages. But the logic behind the Ujamaa villages were correct. They soon need having peasants scattered all over the, the countryside. They need water, they need roads, they need electricity, they need all these things. And then they want the state to provide it. It's a very high cost. So you know, say, come on, you come and put you in a Ujamaa village, you can go and farm walk long distance from, come here, you'll get water, you get electricity, you get schools. But then you see the technology of farming was not advanced to make it possible for farmers to do that. Mm -hmm. So of course, it defeated the logic. Uh, agriculture production went down, mm -hmm. the farmers were there still needing water, electricity, and so on. The state did not have uh, society to tax with enough uh, <laughs> wealth created. Mm -hmm. So the idea of baking the cake big enough before you begin distributing it uh, confronted Tanzania, and they had to begin going slowly on Ujamaa villages. But in Kenya, you can see Ujamaa villages rising up, whether you like it or not. People are moving to markets. Mm -hmm. They are moving to informal sector in Kisumu, and they are presenting you the problem. Now, if you let them move there year in, year out, there will be a bigger problem in the future, mm -hmm. rather than dealing with them when these urban centers are still growing, and having a full-blown policies of urbanization, which notwithstanding COVID, will always be there to reproduce and support people's livelihoods. Mm -hmm. And I think this is what uh, 
uh, AfriCities uh, 2021 is going to be about. As Joe was saying, how do we make sure that the lives and livelihoods of people are guaranteed in a setting where life is planned and where the majority of people are living in urban centers? Urban centers is a reality that is here with us. It happened after the Industrial Revolution in Europe. Our revolution was interrupted by, by colonialism. By the way, urbanization was already occurring in Africa in places like Timbuktu, Mombasa, and so on, when the colonialists came and disrupted us. Now, having been disrupted, we must recapture our history now and make sure that we are plan our urban centers in a manner that will support to produce and repro reproduce the livelihoods of our people. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Liz, uh, <laughs> God forbid there is another pandemic of this magnitude, or even worse, and then you have, uh, like you said, so many of uh, the people living in urban centers living within informal settlements, and you described it as uh, perhaps two centimeters from uh, each other. And also, what's, what's critical is that most of them are actually within the informal employment sector. So, so these are people who have to go out on a daily basis. Yeah, <laughs> and so, the public health concerns come about, uh, you know, when you have a pandemic or a disease of this kind that can be spread by human interaction. What are the experiences that you've had in your interactions with some of these people, and what message are you communicating by way of just avoiding and reducing uh, those uh, interactions, do you think? Um, unfortunately, you know, Africa remains the continent with the lowest level of universal health coverage. I'm standing at about 43%. And, you know, with only 43% of its population achieving at least some level of quality health care. I think what we need to do is even as we think about urbanization and the planning, we need to really take cognizance of what do the health systems look like and how do we address that? Um, because then it becomes a growing challenge, which we'll go back into. And just going into what Louis had talked about, um, technology, and just permeating from your question, one of the experiences that we've, we've seen is people have become very innovative. People in, in communities like, for instance, Uganda, even in Kenya, where, you know, they're not able to afford the proper water tanks or hand washing um, places, they've come up with their own very ingenious ways of, you know, mechanizing, whether it's um, what we call mtungis or big bottles, for lack of a better word, to ensure that there's that supply of water. But also when we're talking about technology, we've seen young people and the youth remain the key forces of sustainable development. We've seen young people come out, there are 14 students, one of them featured um, in this book, Hashtag Youth Can, just showing resilience of young people in coming up with a ventilator. Uh, Fidel Makatia and his team, he's only 23, came up with a ventilator, developed it from just watching YouTube. Um, so it, to, it goes to show you that there's so much demographic dividend for youth that we don't leverage on. We've seen people coming up with hospital beds. We've seen that there, there's a lack of enough ICU beds, yet there's a lot of opportunity out there to ensure that um, these pandemics do not really handicap our economic development as well. So just as I wind up, you know, the future, our future um, really depends on how we respond to these pandemics, how we are able to prevent, protect against, control, curb, and what other policies and how do we implement these policies to ensure that no one is left behind? Okay, thank you. Louis, um, what Governor alluded to, which is uh, rural to urban migration, most, most people coming into these urban centers and cities to seek employment. And uh, the more they come, the more the numbers, the lesser the opportunities. And, and one of the things, as uh, Liz says, is uh, innovation and, and, and using technology as a core uh, into that, uh, that we have seen as providing platforms for new employment for young people and, and for city dwellers. Really, what opportunities exist within technology to provide some of these opportunities for people who are coming from rural areas into the cities so they don't have to depend on you know, formal employment where I have to be uh, in an office somewhere every day or sending CVs here and there? Yeah, Edmund, let me, let me try by way of example uh, my own observation. 
I come from a place called Homer Bay, which is on the other side. Mm -hmm. and, and when you look at the potential from an economic point of view, you start to see the opportunity for where technology can change and reduce or slow down the migration, certainly change the migration in a manner that creates this metropolis I was talking about, kind of format of a city. Instead of people going to one point, mm -hmm. they might go to the periphery of a city for the purposes of residences and services, but go back for some economic activity somewhere else. So if you're going to Homer Bay, you're pretty much going to see markets all along. You're likely to see a bunch of young people sitting under some roof mm -hmm. uh, on border borders. I look at those people as transport service providers. They look at themselves as people who provide transport for, of persons. One problem, a case of underutilized or underemployment. In the same neighborhood, you'll see mamas or women walking down from at two o'clock carrying sacks, trying to go to a market mm -hmm. to sell their goods, okay? I see an opportunity, sometimes negative times negative equals to positive. I see an opportunity of taking, making these transporters people who go and collect the produce from the mamas in their homes and paying them there so they don't have to mm -hmm. come to the markets, while at the same time, these people make money by changing from movement of persons to movement of persons and goods. My own little experiment showed that it's a factor of 10. For every one person that an average um, uh, border, border person moves, there are 10 sacks of maize to be moved from the hinterland to the main road so that somebody can collect that in mass and therefore create wealth where it is, okay? So the only thing required there is the technology platform. I have maize, I see that you have maize, I see your GPS location, I come and collect it, and so forth. So if we organize ourselves mm -hmm. as economic entities of that, of that manner, deal with the supply side of, product, of, of producing of what we normally do, mm -hmm. we can then attract people who can come and collect the maize in quantities of 28 tons or 47 tons. Even those people want a view of how much maize is on the road between Rodikopang and Sori. If they can see multiples of 28 tons, you will see more lorries moving down there by themselves. So that's a classic case of just l opening your eyes, seeing the opportunities, applying the technology, and remembering that te technology itself is never an end, it's simply a means. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so, um, Governor, uh, uh, beyond just COVID-19, we've seen disease outbreaks within uh, you know, cities and urban centers as a result of poor sanitation, yeah? So you have garbage lying everywhere, diseases are spreading out of that. You have unclean and unsafe water to consume, and so diseases are born out of that. Mm -hmm. How do we move forward on that front to just make sure that um, the cities are clean, first of all? Um, you know, we are breathing uh, fresh air <laughs> and, and, and consuming and using clean water. What role do you have to play as uh, governments and leaders in, in providing some of those necessities? You know, there are certain functions, certain responsibilities that governments cannot outsource to individuals. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't outsource certain responsibilities to communities or individuals. There are certain social goods which are by their very nature public responsibilities. Mm -hmm. They are very nature government responsibilities. I call it the provision of social goods. For example, you can't make me as an individual responsible for the air that we breathe. You can assign me a duty not to do certain things that affects the air that we breathe mm -hmm. by law. But the responsibility of making sure that the air is there that we breathe is that state. You see what I mean? So if somebody is doing something that contaminates the air, it's the responsibility of the state to stop them. Mm -hmm. Because uh, that, that responsibility cannot be outsourced to individuals or, or, or other entities. Laws are there to make sure that environmental behavior is carried out by individuals according to what the public law or government does. So that is, that is, air is a social good. Therefore, it must be provided by, or guaranteed by government. Secondly, health. You see, we have seen through COVID that uh, wearing masks is enforced by law. Because if I don't wear a mask, 
I can pass COVID to another person. Mm -hmm. Government is make there to make sure that it reminds you that this is your individual responsibility, whether you like it or not. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. Thirdly, education. I mean, you, yes, we can have in a family as much education as possible given by parents, but if a child wants to be a civil engineer, I, I'm sorry, I would not be able to decrypt my daughter or my son to be a civil engineer. There must be a school where they go, yes. which is a social good. It is provided for everybody, and even if there are people in the private sector providing education, but within a certain perimeter established by public order. Mm -hmm. So it is it's responsibility of government. Secondly, security. You see, you see the people walking around here with uniform. Mm -hmm. They are here to provide security. You and I pay them through taxes we give government that, yes, now you have the ability to provide security. It's now your role. That's another social good. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the fourth thing which people never really realize is, is a social good is food. You see, Louis had just said uh, that the border borders are there if they, are, uh, they have phones uh, and, and there's a digital system of knowing where maize is or rice is, they can drive there and get it and bring it to where it is needed. Mm -hmm. That whole system of making you sure that food moves from uh, the, the production point to the user point is not determined by any one individual. It's determined by a system that, that is created in a market that doesn't, people think that markets function in and by themselves. Not really. If you look at the development of markets, they have been heavily influenced by public order. Mm -hmm. By some, yesterday we spoke of de-risking credit, didn't we? Who de risk credit? You can't ask Stephen Katigama to de risk credit. It's a public entity that comes with policy to de risk credit. And we realize that de risk credit is very important for economic recovery in our nation. Mm -hmm. Therefore, all these social goods in the final analysis, as you are saying, that they are waste, what not, people don't have it, it is because government broke down. Government abdicated its responsibility and then set, out some, set, set down somewhere collecting taxes, mm -hmm. but making sure that tax is given for government to behave in a certain way, and it didn't. Mm -hmm. So that's why when I was talking about uh, urbanization, I itemized all kinds of things to be done, and then finally talked about governance and public policy. Yeah. Because those things must provide what is called public policy, which is not made by you and I sitting in the market somewhere and doing it. We can express our, our views, but in the final analysis, there's a receptacle called government, mm -hmm. which aggregates them and comes out, this is the direction we are going, these are the laws we are going to obey. Okay. Lisa, uh, briefly, uh, because our time is almost out, um, I think, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about Nairobi in this, the national government of uh, Kenya <coughs> having uh, perhaps at some point realized that uh, the medical facilities within the city were not enough to support the need, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic. And so some uh, uh, structures were being set up in rural, uh, sorry, in formal settlements and, and slums and, 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 and all of that. In terms of some of the basic social amenities that we need, um, you know, in cities and urban centers, and more so medical facilities, because this is very critical, where are we and what, how do we need to build on this going forward, do you think? By the president and the national government as well, in terms of ensuring, noting that, you know, the, the need that we have cannot be superseded or be affected by the hospitals that we have. So we have been supporting um, the government in setting up 19 health facilities in these informal health settlements. The work is in progress, um, will come to a completion very soon. And, and this is a great step when, you know, the government creating an um, environment for uh, partners like ourselves and the private partners to also come to play. And as Professor puts it, it's everybody's responsibility. And in, in the future, you know, what we have been and consistently advocate for, you know, there's the famous saying that says health is wealth. So, and, and this is a perfect example where health needs to always be put as a priority. And when you're talking about Edmond, the <laughs> basics, it's the primary health care. Yeah, 
how do you know people get vaccinations how do how what is the distance between the nearest health facility to our community um we're talking about mothers being able in this decade to safely give birth we have a lot of incidences where mothers are, you know, combating fistula and other, you know, obstetric fistula and other issues related to giving birth, which shouldn't be happening in this decade. So those are the bare minimums that we need to ensure that we can be able to capture or cab um, at the primary health care centers. But that has been well on the way. I think one of the things that this pandemic has shown us is that the government being the driver and you know the rest of us whether it's individual citizens whether it's private sector the development sector all coming together to work towards a, a common cause which ideally should be that same narrative we do and we cross pollinate across all the other sectors okay uh, uh, ms maimuna uh, as a closing remarks how do we proceed from here what do you foresee as a future of uh, afri cities Uh, I think uh, we may have lost her uh, because of tech. Louis, you, you see now what we need to build on going forward <laughs> by way of tech <laughs> if we had to facilitate some of these advancements that we are talking about. Closing remarks on uh, technology and how that is going to influence uh, Afri cities going forward. Yeah. Um, again, I'm a technologist, so I'll be one of the first people to tell you, those of us who have spent time in technology understand that technology is not an end. It's a means. Mm -hmm. um, it's you always need to look at what you're trying to achieve and figure out how technology has a role in that. But just in terms of just general comments, uh, as, as my closing comments, I definitely see, and I already feel that's already happening, mm -hmm. is that particularly in places where you can't intervene, social distancing, highly populated places, uh, in urban centers. There's certain things you can't do. A lot of it has to be personalized, right? So I, I certainly see personal spacing being redefined. The idea that you can speak in my face <laughs> is going away. I'm already seeing that. Now that we know about particles. And yeah, yeah, I'm already seeing that behavior. You start speaking with your mouth away from somebody else. You start speaking a little further. That's becoming normal. So it used to be that if you're hugging me, you're interfering with my personal space. Now it's becoming normal that if you're within 1.5 meters of me, you're interfering with my personal space. I see that becoming normal. We might not carry masks all the time going future. But I see as many washing centers um, as garbage collection points in cities now. Uh, I, exp I hope to see, wherever you see a garbage bag in the public, there should be a washing thing next to it. Mm -hmm. That should, should be something we intervene. But in terms of technology, really, uh, you just kind of have to look at what does technology do to enable okay. some of the things we need to accomplish. Okay. We have uh, Ms. Maimuna back. And uh, so my question to you would be, uh, looking forward and going forward, really, what is the future of Afri cities, do you think? Yeah, thank you very much. I'm so sorry that I just offline for a while. Yeah, I think the future city, uh, future for the every cities is very, very great. I would like to, to end uh, uh, this session with four proposals to be discussed during the four, uh, during the every cities. One, I think that we really need to rethink the state and reorganizing the local governance uh, mechanism, looking at the way we manage the cities, the way we plan, that we design, uh, cities as innovation hub, the creativity, the integrated planning, the rules of law and the enforcement, communication and edu uh, advocates and education. I think that is one is very, very important. The second part that I would like to put forward for the every cities discussion is that how we address the increase of poverty and exacerbation of inequalities in cities, mm -hmm. how we deal with the human rights approach, rural urban migration, the pull and the push factor of of the, of the cities and the rural area in terms of housing, employment, education, uh, recreation, and, and, and culture. I think this is very, very important. And a human rights approach, mm -hmm. including the ID and refugee. The third part that I would like to put forward is that to rethink the urban morphology and typologies uh, in creating new evidence on density and compactness. Go back to the integrated planning, go back to the not unplanned urban sprawl. We have to look into the planned city extension, 
how we localize the new urban agenda to achieve the 17 SDG, especially the SDGs 11 and leaving no one behind. And last but not least, uh, uh, Nepal, is that how we can reduce the failure of the current urban economy business model. How we will look into the new model to take into the, as what the governor said, air is a social good, health is a social good, uh, and, and, and uh, uh, security and food. What is the new model? How we can include the, the, the principle I used to put forward, the 4P, public, private, people partnership in looking into the new economy business model. Thank you very much. Over to you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Ms. Maimuna. Governor, finally and very briefly, what should we expect based on this conversation uh, during Africa cities, Africa cities, I should say, 2021? I, I think Maimuna really has summarized it very well. I think this is what I was hinting at. He's really briefed the whole picture very clearly. Now, just to me, am I being heard? Can you please? Uh, Somebody has yeah. muted me. Okay, fine, I'm back in there. <laughs> and is this muting? If somebody else is listening, just mute him. Um, sometimes very difficult to mute people in other circumstances, but that's okay. Mukisa can blame me on that. <laughs> now, <laughs> I think one thing that really, to me, I think one thing that COVID did, it just reminded us the tragedy of unplanned use of urban space. Mm -hmm. The tragedy of unplanned use of urban space. My typical example is trading. I don't know what told Africans that in order to trade, you must go next to a road and spread all over until when cars are coming, you have to know that this is a road, not a marketplace. And it happens everywhere. And it's <laughs> extremely disorderly and actually very dangerous for both people using roads and <laughs> the traders themselves. You see, I tell my people in Kisumu, why is Ketias there and... Uh, what is the other one, uh, Nakumat there? Why are all these supermarkets there? People go to them. Why do you insist that people will only, you will only sell to people when they are passing, when they are walking? The market is on the road. People going to work and they remember, I need to buy some handkerchief and they buy it. No. Why do you think people build supermarkets? Because they know that if somebody needs something, they will come to you. And during colonial times, in my area, for example, there were marketplaces, mm -hmm. and they are still there, and they were fenced. And you go there twice or three times a week. It also helped people to discipline themselves, do shopping when it is necessary. But by the road, you feel that any time somebody passing is shopping time. One, one would argue, Governor, that <laughs> we can't all build supermarkets. No, yeah, but, and, but, and, but and then you, no, not supermarket, but at least somewhere you are you trade, which is, which is organized. Yeah. not interfere with me that I'm going to, to watch a football match and say, can you buy an egg? And me, really? <laughs> so COVID told us that get all these people, put them in a stadium somewhere where it is organized, where they can keep social distance. Mm -hmm. Now shall we shall, should improve on the stadium because in Kisumu we need our stadium. So after COVID, or <laughs> notwithstanding COVID, we are creating... Mark, we, call it, we call them business centers. Yes. You know, in Kisumu, we like to use words which are more decent, like market. <laughs> Uhuru business complex. It makes sense, you see. <laughs> and then Chichwa market, you know. So uh, the, the, this, I think if they, anything we learned from COVID is that this trading by the road without keeping social distance and interfering with other people's motion should be a thing of the past. <laughs> and let's have Uhuru business complexes everywhere so that we can go to them like we go to Ketias or, or, or Nakumat. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Governor, uh, Professor Nyang Yongo. And, uh, of course, uh, Ms. Maimuna Sharif, the Under Secretary uh, General and Executive Director of UN Habitat. Liz Ntonjira is the Global Communication Director, AMREF Health Africa. And Mr. Louis Otieno here is the non-executive director at Nation Media Group and also an IT expert, uh, discussing really the future of Afri cities in the face of what we have experienced uh, and we continue to experience in, in the world right now. Thank you so much for your contributions. Our next session is on a Kenyan recovery. Please uh, just uh, step out of the stage. Thank you. And uh, have your seats. 
it, once I sit down, we'll do it in an orderly manner. Thank you, thank you for reminding me. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, thank you, Governor and uh, Louis. So, all right, let's, let's do it then in a formal manner, like uh, learned and decent people in the great city of Kisumu, all right? One, two, three. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, as we set up for our next uh, panel discussion, uh, which will be guided by our editor, Business and Partnerships, uh, Julian Samboko, please just uh, step onto the stage and uh, let's have your uh, panelists who are at least participating physically to also come onto the stage, if any. Um, yes, it is important to sanitize uh, so that uh, we keep healthy here. Like I said yesterday, there's, uh, the sheriff is here, the CAS in the Ministry of Health, to just observe how we are operating and uh, whether we are observing some of these uh, measures. So as we set up for that, uh, any comment uh, from any member of uh, the audience here uh, on the discussion that we've had this morning? I see a microphone has been set uh, somewhere along uh, the, the pathways within the conference hall. Any, any comment, if, if at all? As we set up, yes? Do you have any? An addition, perhaps a comment, a question? Okay, thank you so much. Anyway, as we set up, um, remind, a reminder to you that our hashtag is uh, KusiFest2020 and the uh, Wi-Fi ID in here is Kusi Ideas Festival and you don't need a password for that. Over to you, Julian, for the next session. Right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the session where we are discussing Kenyan recovery and East African recovery. And my panelists will all be virtual. They shall be joining us shortly. But what I would like us to apply our minds to in the next uh, 40 or so minutes is really disaggregating this discussion. Many times when you talk about the recovery, it's the question is, is it uh, V-shaped recovery? Is it U-shaped? And it sounds extremely far-fetched and at distance from us. So we are disaggregating this into various sectors to the best that we can, and at least um, getting it into a way we can relate. And uh, we will be having Dr. Carmen Nidegira, who is from the Destination Management and Tourism Policy uh, in Burundi, where she's an analyst. We shall be having Dr. Narendra Raval, the Chief Executive Officer of the DevKey Group. We shall also be having Mr. Hosea Mashuki, the Chief Executive Officer of the Fresh Produce Exporters Association of Kenya. And we shall also be joined by Mr. Tewolde Gebre Mariam, who is the Group Chief Executive Officer of the Ethiopian Airlines, to give us a perspective of how aviation is unfolding and the role it will play as far as the recovery of Kenya and the larger East Africa is concerned. So that is a discussion we'll be looking into. And the key question is, how does East Africa get back the robust economic growth that was projected pre-pandemic? Of course, we've had a couple of shocks, so we are looking at how to build resilience and really a carry forward from the conversation we had yesterday in two sessions. The first one was on the shape of the economy going forward, and the second one was on digging the economy out of crisis. And uh, maybe just to uh, put the question out there, um, when we think about a Kenyan or East African recovery, what comes to mind? And I don't know whether we have a revolving mic uh, around which uh, could help us. Uh, I would request if you could walk to the mic stand uh, so that we get some thoughts. Dr. Kitui, do you want to share a thought or two about uh, an East African recovery just before we kick start? <laughs> I see. So we'll be unpacking that subject to see uh, what this means for the region, what this means for East Africa, as we get our panelists uh, set for the conversation which we should be starting shortly. This will be taking us into the second last session of the Kusi Ideas Festival. Just one minute, I fix this. Technology, Louis, thank you so much. Um, 
Julian, thank you. As uh, we organize uh, the virtual panelists, uh, just to remind us um, again that uh, COVID-19 is real. Please let's uh, adhere to those uh, strict guidelines and also to participate uh, w uh, in the conversations that we are having here, uh, at least online, if uh, you're not among us. Uh, the hashtag is uh, KusiFest2020. Uh, since yesterday, we've had some very, very, very good uh, deliberations and discussions on matters affecting the continent, where we are, and how we proceed from here uh, for the betterment of this continent. Africa alone has, uh, I think, two or three of the fastest growing economies in the world at, at present, Ethiopia being among them, uh, Julian, so you will be speaking to the, uh, uh, the CEO of uh, Ethiopian uh, Airlines. And so as uh, we set up for that, uh, let's uh, keep engaging really on any of the sessions that we've had that um, you maybe have a contribution um, on. And while at that as well, within the audience, if there's anyone who has a point, not really specific to what Julian's will be discussing, uh, anything that we've discussed across the two days, please feel free as we set up for this. Are we ready? But uh, then as, as we continue with that, then Julians, I think, uh, let me ask you this question. How do you think we do it? Because uh, we had uh, from the president yesterday, uh, Uhuru Kenyatta, His Excellency, uh, and he says um, some of these relief measures will be coming to a close, you know, at the end of this month. How, how do we do it? Because many people are still within the trenches, so to speak. It's a very good question you're asking because I had this conversation with the CS of the National Treasury, that is Honorable Okuriatani. And the truth of the matter is that if you read the Article 4 from the IMF uh, concluding the mission statement in Kenya in November, which is just uh, last month, mm -hmm. there was the call for um, fiscal consolidation, as they term it. And that should ensure that we are ramping up our revenue, especially given that uh, our tax base is not as wide as we would have desired mm -hmm. because our tax to GDP ratio has been on a general decline. And what the signal that sends is that now it, when it comes to mobilizing our revenue, we have a challenge. Yes. So the um, fiscal stimulus measures by the words of the Treasury CS were that it should be temporary, it should be targeted, it should be timely. And therefore there was a time to come when this would be reversed. Mm -hmm. There are divergent views. This should go on a little longer into the end of the next financial year but clearly there's a lot of pressure on the government as far as revenue mobilization goes. Trade is very key to this, and uh, I think between Kenya and Uganda, we've had uh, issues um, you know, uh, along the border, uh, movement of goods and, and trade volumes also being affected by that. Uh, are there any measures to at least reduce that backlog that we are seeing in, in Busia and the other uh, you know, border points, really? Yes, we had a sit down with the CS Aidan Mohammed, who heads up the East African integration, and we had a conversation around the bottlenecks that exist across the borders mm -hmm. and how this is being streamlined. The issue has been with the COVID uh, specifications of uh, the um, testing, there was a bit of challenge. You are supposed to do it in Kenya, mm -hmm. you enter Tanzania or Uganda, you're supposed to do it again, and that created a backlog. But he assured us, us that uh, the same is being streamlined, uh, at least looking into 2021, mm -hmm. so that we don't have that uh, non-tariff barrier uh, to trade. Okay. And I hear, I hear Jose Amashuki of the um, Fresh Produce Exporters Association of Kenya is now ready to join us in the conversation, a Kenyan recovery and East African recovery. Jose, if you can hear me, we are having this conversation at a time when Kenya and the UK are engaging in a post-Brexit trade deal extremely critical if you consider the volume of exports that we take to that market. How do you expect this to impact the recovery? I think the horticulture sector is one of the, the one that was hardest hit when COVID-19 started in the East African region. Hosea, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, uh, as you are aware, UK and uh, Kenya are negotiating uh, trade deal that was actually signed yesterday by the ministers. This is very important for us. We did uh, request the government to be able to negotiate for two key things, uh, duty-free, quarter-free entry of uh, Kenyan fresh produce into the UK, and we have been able to get that, so we are happy about it. And so we see a potential for increase of our fresh produce exports by about 5% into the UK market uh, by 2025. And this, uh, you know, will really assist uh, the growers, uh, farmers, and exporters uh, of the Republic of Kenya. Thank you. 
Hosea, just to stay with you uh, before I let you go, the question of uh, phytosanitary conditions has been a sticky issue as far as our exports accessing the international markets are concerned. Even as we prepare for the demand side, how are we streamlining this on the supply side? Because uh, now that the responsibility falls within our side, not the European market. Thank you very much. Um, as you're aware, uh, we, as uh, representatives of the growers and exporters, are working around the globe to ensure that we fulfill the requirements of the market. And according to you know WTO uh, rules, we, we are basically looking at um, doing our bit to ensure that uh, whatever that we export uh, out of this country, uh, you know, adheres to the national and international standards. So uh, the you know, government agencies uh, that are, you know, in this area, especially the Kenya Plant Health Inspector Service, working with the Health Culture Crop Directorate, and ourselves as growers and exporters, uh, working closely uh, under the leadership of the Minister of Agriculture to ensure that uh, our farmers are well trained, they position themselves in a manner that uh, they will be able to grow that which is good and is good for Kenyans and also is good for the rest of the market. Thank you. And uh, just before we cross over to someone else, we're trying to get a hold of them. Uh, Hosea, one of the key developments in the year 2020, aside from COVID, is the fact that we've seen a significant depreciation of the Kenya shilling vis-a-vis -vis other global hard currencies. If you look at the dollar, for example, we closed yesterday at 111.30 units, which is about 9% down since the start of the year. Ideally, this would have meant a very good development on your side as an exporter. How has it been, and how do you see it going into 2021? Because that would mean then our exports are becoming a lot cheaper in the global market. In fact, if, we, if, if you look at the figures for 2019, the total export value was uh, 153 billion Kenyan 